Um, okay, cool. Thanks very much for having us. Um, so yeah, as you've just heard, I'm Vicky Aveson. I am the lead data engineer at Cox Automotive UK, and Alex Bush is with me. He used to work with me at Cox Automotive, but now he's emigrated to New Zealand and works for KPMG Lighthouse. So me and Alex have worked in big data for about five and a half, six years, something like that. Um, mostly together, but sometimes not together, like now. Um, and we've worked in a number of different companies across a number of different industries, like energy, uh, betting and gaming, finance, government, and like, now for me, automotive. Um, and I guess what we've really discovered over all this time is how similar all these places are, um, particularly in like, the data problems they're trying to solve. Um, actually, kind of everyone's sort of doing the same thing, just slightly differently. So that's really been the basis of a lot of the work that me and Alex have done over the past couple of years and what we're going to be talking about today. So um, I'll just introduce uh, Cox Automotive briefly, because that's where I work. Um, so Cox Automotive is the world's largest automotive services company, and I work for Cox Automotive UK, which is the UK arm of that, funnily enough. Um, so Cox Automotive UK is a parent company for a number of subsidiary brands um, that all deal with aspects of the automotive sector. Um, so here are some of them. So we've got Mannheim Auctions, which does online and physical vehicle auctions, uh, MoveX, which deals with vehicle transport logistics, um, Modix, which does digital marketing for the automotive industry, and Nextgear, which uh, deals with dealer stock planning, providing finance on the forecourt, stuff like that. Um, so in terms of what we're trying to do with data at Cox Automotive UK, it's really like the age-old problem. We've got all these different businesses with lots of different disparate data sources. We've got a central data team and a central data platform. We're trying to bring lots of things into one place to provide unified analytics and reporting over the top of it. Um, so this is kind of like one of the things I meant when I said lots of companies are trying to solve the same problem. I kind of see this everywhere. Data is spread out in lots of different formats. We want to bring it together and do something useful with it. Um, in terms of tech stack, uh, we're using Azure data, we're all in platform as a service in Azure, um, using Azure Data Lake storage to actually store our data, and then we're using Azure Databricks for our production and interactive workloads. And then we've got Tableau kind of over the top of that, serving dashboards um, to users across the business. That's kind of how they interact with our platform. Oh dear. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. introduce KPMG. so I'm currently working at KPMG Lighthouse, so this is a center of excellence for information and analytics, and it kind of represents a new direction for KPMG, kind of alongside their existing tax and audit businesses. We're now providing um, services to clients right away across the data value chain. So that's everything from data strategy, data engineering, data science, right the way through to you know, analytics. So really just helping clients make the most of you know, their data assets. Cool. Um, so what is this talk about? Um, so firstly, I'll kind of define what we mean by data pipeline because it kind of means different things in different contexts to different people. So I'll just kind of clarify what we mean. And I'll look at like, who we've got in a data team and who's actually kind of building these data pipelines out. Um, then I'll talk about kind of why data pipeline development is actually quite hard to do well because kind of on the face of it, the problems don't look that hard. But when you kind of dig a bit deeper and try and do it reliably and Robustly and performantly, it kind of gets a bit trickier. Um, and then, well, Alex mostly is going to talk about the way that how we've changed the way we develop and deploy our data pipelines over the past couple of years um, to alleviate some of these difficulties. And we'll be introducing WiMAC, which is an open source project we've developed kind of to deal with a lot of this. So, yeah, firstly, as I said, what are data pipelines and who's building them? So to begin with, yeah, as I said, data pipeline kind of means different things in different contexts. So what we're really talking about is batch ETL pipelines, not really talking about streaming applications, although probably some things can be transferred, but we're really talking about batch ETL stuff. And um, we're not talking about machine learning applications either. That kind of comes after all of this. So as an example of a data pipeline, we kind of start off with our data sources. Um, so, like this is an example of one that we have. Uh, Mannheim Auctions, we're ingesting data in two formats. One, they're sending us some CSVs, and also we're connecting to a, an Azure SQL database, which contains some different data. So, the first stage of any data pipeline is like the ingestion stage. Um, so, this is just ingesting the raw data as it is, kind of warts and all, I guess. Um, there's always problems in your source data, but this isn't the time to deal with that. This is just get everything in as it is. Um, 
And then the next stage, which is what we kind of call business logic stage, um, this is where we kind of make that data useful for further analysis and serving dashboards to our business users. So this is kind of cleaning up the raw data, getting rid of all that kind of nasty stuff we don't want to see, um, deduplicating, enriching, and building out kind of business-focused data models that are more useful for that further analysis. So this is joins and aggregations that kind of create more useful views of the data. So this is really what we mean when we say data pipeline. And actually, we quite often split this into two. So we'll have ingestion pipelines and we'll have business logic pipelines because the ingestion pipelines tend to, once we've developed them, they don't really change very much, but the business logic pipelines kind of change quite a lot as we add more logic, develop more data models. So we tend to keep them separate. So who have we got in a data team? So uh, a typical data team will have data engineers, business intelligence analysts, data scientists. Um, kind of, I think to have a really effective data team, you sort of need all those different skill sets. Um, uh, but everyone in that team is offering something different. Everyone can program, um, just the focus of their programming is slightly different. So I've kind of lumped people into data engineers and non-data engineers here, um, because the data engineers are the people who are providing the deep understanding of the technology. So they understand the big data technology. They understand how to make it perform. They're looking out on the market for new stuff that's coming. Um, and they're software engineers. They really know how to care about those software engineering concerns, how to make things robust, how to make it reliable, how to make it maintainable, and how to make it perform. Um, whereas business intelligence and data science, they have the deep understanding of the data. So they work closely with the business, and they know how to derive like meaningful business value out of the data. So this is kind of what everyone is offering in this team. So in terms of what this means uh, for who's building the data pipelines, data pipelines are software projects, essentially, and data engineers are the software engineers, so it does end up being them. And I'll kind of explain that in a bit more detail now. So why is data pipeline developer actually quite hard to get right? Um, because that diagram I drew earlier, it doesn't kind of look that hard. Get some data in, clean it up, happy days. But I'll hopefully try and convince you that it's a bit harder than it might look on the surface. So what do we need to think about when we're building pipeline? So I'll just kind of go through a list of things that I'll always have in my head when I'm first building a new data pipeline. Um, it's not a complete list, but it's just quite a few things. Um, so firstly, like how do we handle late arriving or duplicate data? I mean, this is kind of an obvious one that you really need to be thinking about every time, particularly when you're not in control of how the data is getting to you. So like I said, we're being sent some CSVs. They come out of order. They come twice, four times, whatever. We're not in control of how that's arriving to us, so we have to be able to deal with that. Um, how can we ensure that if the pipeline fails partway through, we can run it again without any problems. I don't know if there's a networking problem in Azure and our pipeline fails. We don't, have to want, we don't want to have to go in and do lots of manual cleanup just to make it run again. And also, if we kind of run something twice in succession, maybe by accident, maybe on purpose, I don't know. We don't want it to negatively impact the output. Um, how do we avoid the small file problem? So I won't talk about this, really, because everyone's talking about it quite a lot at the moment with Delta Lake coming out. Um, basically, lots of small files are a bad thing, and they have been for a while, so we've been having to deal with this. Um, how do we monitor data quality? Um, I don't know if you have something where you suddenly see lots of nulls coming in a column where you weren't expecting there to be. You want to be able to monitor on that. You want to be able to alert. Um, and how do we configure our application? This is important when you're developing, because you need to be able to run against development data or write to development areas or yeah, read from different databases staging databases, whatever. So there's a whole load of configuration scaffolding that goes around any application. Um, how do we maximize performance? So yeah, obviously, no one wants, wants an application that's going to run for hours and hours, cost lots of money. Um, so that's obviously a big one. And kind of final one I've got in here, like how do we extract only what we need from a source? So for example, if we're connecting to a relational database, we don't want to go and pull all of the data every single time. We want to kind of keep track of what we've already read and only pull kind of changes that have happened. Um, so I guess the point I'm trying to make with all of this stuff is like none of these problems individually are very hard to solve um, if you know what you're doing, but it's just quite a long list of things you have to be thinking about every time. And you're kind of just solving the same problems over and over again. It's a lot of overhead. So 
kind of results in, I don't know, I'm definitely guilty of copying and pasting stuff from application, particularly the configuration stuff, and you end up with slightly different versions of the same code, even within an organization, across organizations as you go from place to place. So I guess that's really what I'm trying to point out here. So that's kind of aside from doing the business logic bit, but what about the business logic? What's kind of hard about that? So kind of just sketched out like what a typical business logic flow would look like uh, in one of our applications. So we'd always start with the deduplicated raw data, then we do some cleanup, data type versions, make the column names a bit more helpful, um, add derived columns, stuff like that. And then we want to write out these kind of cleaned up, more usable tables um, to be used for further analysis later on. And then after that, we'd want to create some of these data models, do aggregations, do joins, and then we'd want to write these out as well to be used later down the line. So this really doesn't sound very hard, particularly when Spark provides like nice, friendly, high-level APIs that make it very easy to do joins, aggregations, all of this business logic stuff. But this also gets a bit tricky after a while. So if you, I don't know, one of the problems is you can very quickly end up in what I would call spaghetti code territory if your flow gets more and more complicated. So we've got one where we've got kind of 300 source tables and maybe like 30 odd data models just because it's what we need. But writing that application in a maintainable, nice way is actually quite difficult and we found ourselves in a situation where it wasn't nice and it wasn't maintainable. Um, and the other problem is around performance. So because Spark is lazy, um, nothing kind of gets executed until you call an action. Um, write is an action, obviously. Um, so all of these things in purple boxes we're wanting to write out. So we're kind of calling table A.write, table B.write, table C.write in our application. But the problem is each time it hits one of these writes, it does a computation, it does that one, and then it moves on to the next, and then it moves on to the next. So these things are happening sequentially, but you can just see from like looking at the flow that they could really, some things could be happening in parallel. So like how do we deal with that? I guess one way is using an external scheduling engine like Uzi or Airflow where you can have these things as separate Spark jobs and then use that to execute the flow and manage dependencies. The problem with that is um, then each of these Spark jobs is running as an entirely separate Spark job. And in the Yarn model, for example, of um, running, each of these would then take up a container in Yarn. And if you don't have a very big Hadoop cluster and you've got lots of these Spark scripts, then you can very rapidly end up in a situation where all of your containers are taken up running drivers and nothing's actually left to run the executors and do work. Um, so that kind of doesn't really scale very well. Fortunately, um, Spark does let us submit actions from different threads, and it's a really, really nice feature of Spark. So it means we can kind of do this parallelism within our one Spark application Problem with that is that you're then dealing with like multi-threaded applications, you're having to deal with Scala features, and it's suddenly this like nice, friendly business logic application has become a lot more complicated. So the one thing I haven't really spoken about yet is deployments. So I guess the way we think about deployments is it's kind of different in data development to how it is in what, I, what we call traditional software development, like building websites or something. So in traditional software development, um, you deploy your software to an environment, and the environment is a physical thing, a server, basically. And the software doesn't necessarily need to know much about its environment, but it's just that is where it's running. And then how a user interacts with your software is kind of direct, really. So if you're using a website, you're directly interacting with that website, and you're receiving a response. Um, in the data world, it's a bit different, because what the user is interacting with is the output of your software, it's the data. Um, and then the environment, because of that, is no longer really a physical environment as such. It's kind of virtual. It's a set of, it's data location, really. It's a set of paths. It's a set of hive, data, hive databases if you need them. So then the, just the way we're thinking about it is quite different. And actually, where you deploy the software doesn't matter that much um, as long as the thing that's running your application can run it. As I said, we're using Azure Databricks, so we deploy our jars to blob storage, and then Azure Databricks can pick it up from there but that's not that important anymore. So the thing about this is there's a lot of tools and best practices around how to manage deployments and environments in this traditional model. Like There's a lot of stuff out there. There's not really very much that thinks about deployments and environments in the way that I've just described for data development. 
And that's kind of been the big challenge for us. Like we were kind of searching for stuff out there and we just couldn't really find it. So just to kind of summarize those last few slides. Um, so the main challenges we found is a lot of overhead for every new data pipeline, even when the problems are actually quite similar every time. Um, production grade business logic is quite hard to write without specialist data engineering skills and there's not really any best practice um, or tools around deploying and managing environments for data pipelines. So um, how have we actually changed the way we develop and deploy our data pipelines? So just want to go back in time a bit to talk about what we were doing. Um, sorry for the Star Wars reference, <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, so how were we dealing with those main challenges that I just described? So the one about being, there being a lot of overhead for every new data pipeline, essentially what we were doing, don't recommend it, we're not very proud of it, but we were basically shoehorning every single new pipeline requirement into one application, which we called the mega app, um, just to kind of over, over, avoid this overhead, because we were like, we've done this over here, we'll just kind of use it. The problem with that is we ended up with this one application that basically solved every single problem we'd ever seen. Um, and, but it just, we couldn't really deploy one thing without deploying everything. Everything was completely linked when it didn't need to be. It wasn't really a very good way of dealing with it. Um, so yeah, not recommended. Uh, production grade business logic, hard to write without specialist data engineering skills. Basically what we had was our colleagues in data science and business intelligence were defining the business logic, maybe implementing their own version and then handing it over to us and then we'd rewrite it or in, put it into a production grade application. Um, there's obviously in, obvious inefficiencies here because you're kind of doing the same work twice. Things get lost in translation. We became a bottleneck because um, no new business audit development could happen without us and it just kept getting stuck. So that wasn't great either. And finally, around there being no tools or best practice around deployments and environments. Um, this is, we're really, really, really not proud of this, but essentially what we were doing was just manually deploying jars where we needed them to be, like passing in environment-specific configuration to our applications when we wanted to run them. This is obviously not great. It's a manual process, prone to human error. We ended up with all these paths everywhere that didn't describe what they were, just like slash data slash test vicky one, two, three, I don't know. It's not, it just wasn't great. Um, but yeah, that's basically where we were. I don't know, maybe like two and a half years ago, something like that. But anyway, yeah, Alex is gonna talk about kind of what we did to make it all better. Thank you, Vicky. Um, so yeah, that neatly describes the, the challenges, but how do we actually go ahead and try and solve those challenges? So the first thing we did was try and identify whether we can make better use of the skills within the teams. Like, you know, are we making an optimal use of each of the teams and the skills they have? Um, so this is a layout of pretty much where the roles and responsibilities used to sit within the different teams. Um, and if we look at how Business Logic actually makes it through to production, we can see how we can maybe improve that process. So we've got business intelligence data science and they've really got you know, the deep understanding of the data. So they're responsible for most of the business engagement, um, the data exploration, um, you know, the defining the problem, trying to understand the problem, then modeling and then producing a set of uh, kind of a business logic definition that they'd like to take to production. And then typically that would be handed over to data engineering. Um, along with uh, you know, the responsibility of the platform and the ingestion applications, um, they take that business logic definition and implement or usually re-implement that business logic in a big data tool, you know, typically in this case Apache Spark. Um, and then that would make it, you know, data engineering would be responsible for running that in production. And this isn't ideal, I guess, for a few reasons. You're not really making best use of the skills within the team here because Usually the logic handed over is a set of SQL scripts or some Python code in I don't know, pandas or something. And then that's essentially re-implemented. So yes, you've got a duplication of effort there. Um, it's probably a quite a large place for mistakes to be made as you make that translation of logic into Spark. Um, assumptions probably made on either side that aren't usually documented. You know, it's quite a wide place for mistakes to you know, come in. And finally, it's not actually clear where the responsibility over the production job actually sits. Um, the, the data engineering are implementing logic they haven't really defined themselves, so they're not 100% sure about what the output should look like. Um, business intelligence, the data science haven't actually directly implemented the 
logic in production, so they don't really have too much responsibility over you know, the actual operation of it. So it's not too clear who actually takes ownership of issues raised with the, the logic in production. So ideally, we'd like to move the business logic applications to a, a shared level of responsibility. And in practice, this means that we have business intelligence and data science actually defining and writing their own business logic um, and taking that themselves to production as a kind of self-service model. So you write your own business logic and take it to production. And that's with the support of data engineering. So we're seeing data engineering as more of a support function that provides kind of two key services. The first one would be a consulting piece. So that's sharing that deep technical information, but in a focused way um, to try and consult with the teams to try and help them do the self-service of business logic. Uh, and secondly, we want to try and lower the barrier to entry for logic to get into production, kind of make it easier to write you know, good production applications. And that's going to require tools and frameworks to actually make that job easier. So the consulting piece is, I guess, fairly straightforward. But in terms of tools and frameworks, you know, what kind of tools and frameworks would we need to actually make that easier to take you know, logic into production? Um, on the top right here, we have the two types of applications we want to focus on. So we actually want to make it easier to write you know, the data ingestion applications um, from, for data engineering, so to trying to simplify those data ingestion applications, as well as you know, making it easier to write business logic applications for data science and business intelligence. And at the bottom, we have really the, the kind of raw ingredients, the, so the, the libraries we'd like to build frameworks on top of. So we don't want to reinvent anything that's already there, but just provide a, a convenience layer on top. So in the framework, we want pretty much everything that Vicky mentioned um, in the problem definition, all of the, you know, the key pieces that are important to make a strong, you know, robust production application, but kind of placed in the framework in a kind of um, you know, write once, use everywhere model, a, a set of predefined recipes to build a production application you know, from. And in terms of tools, we want tools essentially going to make self-service easier. So, um, two big ones here are around environment management. So can we have a self-service dev test prod environment management um, tool? And also a self-service way of deploying applications into those environments. Um, so in terms of a framework, if we were to design a framework, what would it look like? So yeah, we want all of those you know, key production pieces that Vicky mentioned and I've just touched on the framework. We want them there, but we want them um, behind easy to use APIs, like high level APIs. So these are quite complex pieces, but usually you're gonna you, you know, write them once, so you're gonna have a, a unified way of doing configuration management, compaction, deduplication, but have it done once in the framework behind a nice, easy to use you know, API that can be reused uh, in the business logic. Secondly, um, we want, perhaps we can design a framework that makes it more intuitive, um, as to how we define the business logic. So we think of um, pipelines as you know, flows from inputs to transformations to outputs. So can we write a framework that actually helps us structure our code in that way? You know, we're, defining, we're not making large software engineering projects here. We're defining you know, business logic. So we don't need big class diagrams and hierarchies. Can we just have a you know, quite an intuitive flow way of representing how we define our logic? Thirdly, there's the um, optimization piece. So there's always an inherent level of parallelism in ETL flows and data pipelines. So can we be kind of clever about how we schedule uh, actions in Spark to try and exploit some of that parallelism and get some optimization for free? And finally, perhaps we want to um, inject performance optimizations and data monitoring onto that business logic um, without actually directly modifying the business logic. So for example, say business intelligence hand over a set of business logic, um, and you see maybe we can benefit from a Spark cache or some you know, monitoring, some data quality monitoring. But we want to keep the, the business logic and the technical details separate. So is there a way that we can write a framework that can, we can inject these pieces in without actually directly modifying that business logic and keeping a, essentially a line of separation? And finally, deployments. So how do we actually want to manage our deployments? Well, we want to manage our deployments and we want to manage our environments essentially with the same level of granularity and in the same way we would manage our branches and our code. So in this example, we've got a master branch and a feature branch. 
So for each one of those branches, we have a separate environment. Our environment is a, a data path plus a Hive database and a jar deployed into that environment. And then as we push more commits, um, we'd redeploy that jar. And then let's say we have a, a second feature branch, so an independent feature we're developing off uh, in this application. So feature one and feature two are completely independent. Again, we want a, you know, an, a separate environment for that feature branch. We want to keep that level of granularity. Um, that way, we're unable, you know, we can merge our original feature branch, let's say you know, testing and development's finished, and we want to release that. Um, we can actually release that to you know, production without actually merging the other feature branch. So by maintaining this like, higher level of granularity um, at the branch level, um, it actually allows us to push models quicker to production. Um, so it often takes you know, sometimes up to several weeks to prove the correctness of a model. So as long as we keep that level of granularity between independent features, we can push features that are independent and have already been tested um, so they're not holding back a release. And you're also not having the level of granularity in the environment. You're not you know, freezing up an environment while testing ongo is ongoing for that particular you know, model verification. Um, so this is all well and good. You know, these are all quite nice ideas. But what does this actually look like in practice? So this is something we have done in practice. So we have released a, an open source, WiMAC, uh, open source Scala Spark library called WiMAC. Um, that has simplified how we do data ingestion and simplified how we write business logic. And in Cox Automotive, um, we actually have, well, we, I, when I was there, <laughs> and, and Vicky's there now, um, we actually have the whole self-service model working. So we have business intelligence and data science completely comfortable with writing their own business logic in Spark using this framework. So we've simplified a lot of the more complex pieces, and they're comfortable taking that to production. So we have you know, several production pipelines defined completely by business intelligence and data science with the support of data engineering. So um, what does this library look like? So the first example is for data ingestion. So this is how we've simplified our data ingestion pattern for data engineering. Um, so WiMAC starts with a flow. A flow is a collection of actions. An action is something that takes zero or more inputs and produces zero or more outputs um, with a transformation. And inputs and outputs are usually data frames. Essentially, um, between the actions, we'll have a relationship. So we're essentially building a DAG of transformations, the same way we'd represent a DAG earlier um, as an ETL flow. Um, it'll make more sense as I go through. So um, the first action we're, we're running here is um, extract to storage from RDBM. So this is an action that's going to go to a source um, relational database and pull records out of each table and write them to a storage location. Uh, and if you see the connector here, it's a SQL Server temporal connector. So it's going to connect. This is going to be a connector for SQL Server. And it's going to use uh, temporal tables, so the you know, system version history tables, to pull only deltas, so only new records from each one of those tables. So this is new records since the last time we pulled from that database. And it's going to write those to storage, so a file system. But it's going to write them to something called the WiMAX storage layer, which is kind of similar to the De Delta Lake. So as we write in, it's going to um, capture the last updated timestamp for each record. And it's going to capture the primary keys uh, for the table if it's the first time we run. So we're going to capture the last updated. So that will be used the next time we do um, a pull from that table to only pull new records since this time. Um, and the primary keys will be used for deduplication when we come to read. So we're always, doing, we're always capturing the full view of the source system, but doing deduplication as we read from the storage. And finally, we have something called a compaction policy here. So we have a window of um, 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. So um, the first time this application runs in that window, it's going to compact all of the small files under a certain threshold to a, a larger file, so a kind of self-regulating process. Um, by having a window, we can offload you know, the heavy-duty compaction operations to non-peak hours. And then we have a, an execute. So like Spark, WiMAC is lazy, so nothing actually runs until we hit execute. And then in terms of uh, configuration, we have a simple case class parser um, configuration piece here. So given a, um, a case class, we pass that in as a parameter to the case class parser. And then for each one of those arguments, it's going to add the prefix plus the name, and then going to look in the Spark conf and Databricks secrets to find a you know, corresponding value matching that um, prefix. 
uh, and then return a completed case class. So it's quite a, a simplified way of doing configuration. Um, it kind of unifies the Spark Conf and Databricks secret scope and any other additional like, you know, configuration store you might have. Um, the second example we have is uh, the business logic. So this is probably one of the more interesting ones. And as, we, as I go through this example, it's going to match the same way we think about data. So it's, we're going to be doing inputs, then transformations, and then outputs. Um, so the first action is snapshot from storage. So this is actually going to read from the storage location we just wrote our um, tables to. And it's going to, for each one of those tables, produce a consistent view of the, the, the source database as a data frame. It's going to do the deduplication using the primary keys. And we also pass in a timestamp. Um, so that timestamp will be used along with the last updated timestamp of each one of the row, um, each one of the, the rows. So you can produce a consistent view of that table at any point in time. So essentially complete time travel. Um, then we're going to do two transformation actions. So these are just simple um, data frame API transformations. So when we were designing WiMAC, we essentially had the key tenant that we wouldn't hide anything from, you know, from the user from the, that Spark offers. So Spark does what it does very well, so why write you know, a DSL over the top? We just want a bit of convenience framework to help define these things. So these transformation actions, again, it take, in this case, it will take two data frames and produce a third, just with a simple data frame API transformation. And then very similar, we have a, a SQL action, so this is just going to take this raw SQL register those two um, table one and model two data frames as temporary views and then push that to the to spark.sql and then to produce a third reporting one um, data frame. And then finally, we're gonna write these three data frames to two separate Hive tables as um, Hive databases as Hive managed tables. So um, say that is a, you know, a, a business logic definition written by um, business intelligence and they hand that over and you think you know perhaps it could benefit from op some optimization so maybe some caching and so maybe some data quality monitoring so we can add in two extra actions that will intercept the data frames at the point they're generated to produce you know further um, kind of behaviors so in this case we have the spark cache so at the point where model 2 is produced so after the transform um, WiMAC will just like, inject in a, um, just a, a simple Spark cache operation. And then we add a, a DQ check onto reporting one. So WiMAC has um, complete support for Amazon's data quality DQ library. So in this case, it's going to inject at the point of which reporting one is generated as a data frame, a primary key check. So essentially a uniqueness check on the PK1 column. Um, and if it fails that check, it'll throw an exception um, before it gets to the point of writing the table. So you don't, you can, you know, enforce the data quality consistency check before you actually, you know, commit and write that table out. Um, so the next next piece is around environment management. So this is a kind of completely optional piece of WiMAC, but it's a convenient way for uh, people to, a convenient way for us to define our applications um, and parameterize them for environment. So WiMAC provides a, a kind of traded out application um, that you can extend um, to provide you know, a working Spark main so you can submit through Spark Submit and you pass in a type parameter, a case class um, that extends HiveEnv. So that has project, environment, and branch and um, WiMAC will provide for you a, a kind of parameterized environment which consists of a data path and a Hive database and you can use that throughout your application, and you've, you know, you parameterize your application completely for um, this environment. And depending on how you actually execute the, uh, the application, WiMAC will create the data path in the Hive database for you or clean it up if you run it in certain operation modes. And then this is just how you would um, execute that. You know, it's the Spark conf configuration you would pass through to Spark Submit. Um, and once you get to this point, it's fairly easy to start automating your deployments. You now have a consistent way of um, actually defining, you know, building your applications and a consistent way of, uh, you know, defining your environments. Um, so actually managing the automation of uh, deployments becomes quite easy. So this is a screenshot from a tool that, um, called WiMacBot. This isn't actually something we've released in open source yet, but it's something we're hoping to do in the near future. And this is just a simple self-service Slack bot that will 
Um, you talk to it, and it, behind the scenes, um, you give it a, you know, a branch and uh, an environment. It will go ahead and you know, pull that from Git, build it, deploy it into an um, environment, and then run that through Databricks. Um, so yeah, as I say, this isn't something we have released, but something we, we have released is YMAC. So that's up here on GitHub and Maven. Um, we've got quite a complete wiki and a quite a complete readme to get started. Um, you know, something that has really helped us at Cox Automotive um, to speed up the time you know, it takes to take production business logic and running in production. So yeah, if you're interested, please check it out. We're looking for contributors. And likewise, if you've got any tooling or frameworks that you know, you guys have developed as data engineers, you know, we're always interested to hear about that. I think a kind of strong and vibrant data engineering ecosystem of tooling is something that makes kind of everybody's job, everybody's life easier. And so that's us. You have any questions? So I think we have time for three questions. I have one here. Hi. Uh, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, I actually smiled when I saw the two circles and how you move <laughs> the task from left to right, because I'm actually trying to do something very similar. Uh -huh. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how did you deal with the change management? Or did you have that issue when trying to rescope, especially moving the, you know, because I agree it is the double work mm -hmm. of uh, rewriting, let's say, the code from the BI uh, into, uh, uh -huh. let's say, QA uh, standard code. But I am having a very hard time convincing the people on the left <laughs> that, you know, maybe to at least move it slightly to the right. So uh, how, how did you run into something similar or? Um, I don't know, because we, we were the data engineers, so we were the main drivers for that change. We were kind of getting sick of rewriting applications. That, it's not that fun to take <laughs> business logic and continuously write that in Spark and Scratch and then take that. It's kind of. After the first couple of projects, it's a bit of a mind-numbing process, just translating this. And a session, uh, the big thing around, for me, was the responsibility of, and the ownership of the application. It was really hard to get engagement from the people on the right when issues were in production. They kind of thought, you know, the job is in production. The kind of, um, it's the business intelligence's job is finished at that point. So we were kind of driving that change. The hard thing was, for us was getting the buy-in for the people on the right. And that really is where the consulting piece came in. You've got to make people comfortable and got to you know, really help them. Yeah, but I think everyone bought into it in the end because, like, I don't know, I, we have quite a like, big learning environment in our team. Everyone wants to learn more. Everyone wants to get better. Everyone wants to be using their skills as best they can. I think they were getting annoyed with us as well because we were becoming the bottleneck and it was just hard to get stuff through. So mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, everyone just got bought in. But yeah, it's like little baby steps, I guess. Do a little bit, show how it could be useful, and then, yeah. <laughs> OK, well, yeah, one more here. Um, so at one point, you talked about uh, the fact that the Spark session allows you to launch separate tasks on separate threads. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't really show how iMac helps with that. So I was wondering whether uh, there's something in there or, yeah. Uh, yeah, so essentially, iMac is sure. doing all of that under the hood. So, um, so when you're like declaring your inputs and your outputs to your actions, YMAC then goes and essentially builds like a dependency graph, and then everything it can run straight away, it runs in parallel, or like up to a maximum number of things you can run in parallel. And then as soon as another action's dependencies are done, that can then get kicked off. So it kind of handles all that multi-threading under the hood. That was like one of our main motivations for mm -hmm. building it out in this kind of like describe a DAG sort of way, so that we could handle that multi-threading in a transparent like way. Well, we kind of took that one step further. So we had quite a maybe four or so injection projects and a couple of you know, intermediary business objects and then a third one after. Yeah. 
So we, we kind of had YMAC building a flow and actions as a DAG, executing that, but then actually having a kind of meta flow on top. So we'd actually run applications in parallel that were also running tasks in parallel. So it's like a further level of parallelism on top. But yeah, Spark completely handles all that, you know, multi-threading underneath. It's quite neat how it just kind of works. This will be the last question. Let's make sure. OK. Yeah, so a follow-up question then. Um, when you showed, I, I think it's uh, the previous slide, uh, you registered some tables uh, to execute some Spark SQL on it. Mm -hmm. So in the case when you execute several Spark apps uh, on the same cluster, how do you manage the, the different view names? Because here, for example, if you had two times the same application, and you use the same table names on, on your, your two application, they might conflict. So how is that handled? Uh, these are local to the Spark session of your application, so um, it wouldn't affect other things. Well, I mean, in Databricks, we're running everything in separate job clusters anyway, so it's absolutely fine. Um, I don't think they conflict. Oh, we did have, we do have. Tool. But I think the, the catalog is local to the, th yeah. the Spark session. session. So as long as we spawn separate threads, you have essentially a separate table namespace. All right, well, let's thank them one more time for speaking today.